Let's start. So how do we become open glam is one of the titles of today's webinar and my presentation is mainly about trying to frame what becoming open glam means for museums and also about looking at some of the challenges with this development. Uh, I'm not specifically an expert in open glam, uh, but I have a background, as Larissa mentioned, in the museum and archive sector, mostly focusing on photography collections and digital development of museums. And today I'm head of collections and cultural environments at the regional museum, Western Norlands Museum. I'm also the project manager of a research project collecting social photography, which uh, was presented at a previous webinar by my colleague Elisabeth Bog from the Stockholm County Museum. The project aims at producing recommendations for a collection of social digital photography, the photos that we take today with our smartphones. And I'll be shortly returning to the project a bit later in the presentation. So um, today's pres presentation will be partly angled towards photography collections and also digital transformation in museums, as this is a topic of very much of interest for me. Uh, I'll start with a look back at 2010, where I encountered the Open Glam for the first time. Uh, I will talk a bit about licensing and open collections, how museums have approached licensing of especially photography collections. Uh, then have a look at where we are now, as I perceive it, how ready are museums for continuing to work with Open Glam. Uh, then um, not broadening the definition of Open Glam, but rather the next steps of openness. And then I will end with a, a summary. First of all, I'd like to take a look at the definition of Open Glam. And to prepare for this webinar, I'm sure you have discussed this also earlier at webinars, but let's just briefly look at the, the frames of Open Glam. The, the description of this webinar series is about open collections, free to use, but also about participation being able to contribute. Uh, the term digital openness um, uh, is about access to cultural heritage. Uh, and I came across this, uh, the principles of Open Glam by the International Open Glam Working Group. And I realized it's, they were uh, written in 2013 and they are writing new ones in 2020. So they will probably change quite a bit. But uh, just to have a look at what is out there, um, the five rules heritage institutions are invited to follow are to release digital information about the artifacts, the metadata into the public domain using appropriate legal tools and keeping digital representations of works with copyright uh, for which copyright has expired in the public domain in by not adding new rights to them. And when publishing data, we need to make an explicit and robust statement of the wishes and expectations uh, with respect to reuse and repurposing. When publishing data use open file formats which are machine readable and the last one I find especially interesting the um, opportunities to engage audience and audiences in novel ways on the web should be pursued. So uh, as I mentioned the Open Glam Foundation are currently working on a new set of principles that will be released in 2020 and perhaps Larissa you know more about these we could discuss after the presentations. So um, Taking a look back, and this is, of course, from a Swedish perspective, as this is the sector where I've been working in. Um, the current principles from 2013 are quite in line with early development in Sweden around open collections. And uh, discussions started here um, that I came across in late 2009 when Swedish Wikimedia Foundation started to put pressure on heritage organizations, many of which still published collections under full copyright. And at the time I was running the Swedish Secretariat of Photographic Collections and was approached by museums who discovered that their collections now were used in Wikipedia articles, so, so to speak, without their permission. <clears throat> there was a growing discussion on how to respond to this development that I felt needed framing from a broader perspective, not just the museum's perspective, but also to take the users in consideration. And this sounds today like an obvious thing to do, but 10 years ago, Swedish museums were still much 
influenced by the thought of photography collections as a source of income for photographers, for photographers and for the museums themselves. Uh, and there will, were a lot of discussions around copyright and nothing about Creative Commons yet at that stage. Um, so in 2020, 2010, I actually met Tim Wyatt, a Wikipedian at the yearly conference to museums and the web in Denver. Uh, so there, I, there, there was a session on Wikipedia and museums, and uh, we started to discuss the possibility of creating an event in Sweden where these issues could be discussed in a more contemporary way, so to speak. So um, we, I ended up organizing uh, a full day uh, workshop in collaboration with Wikimedia Sweden, <clears throat> and they were very happy to contribute and uh, to uh, engage in this day uh, with very short notice. So only two months later, we managed to gather 70 representatives from all the large archives, libraries, museums, institutions in Sweden. And this is actually a photo from that, <laughs> that day I, that I found online. Um, during this day, Wikipedians met with people from across the, the sector uh, to discuss Creative Commons licenses and find a way forward. And we had invited a representative also from the Swedish Creative Commons organization. And after this day, the Nordic Museum, where I was, I was working at the time, started to do some testing by releasing images from the photography collections under a Creative Commons license. And later, other museums followed with much larger, quanti larger quantities of collections being published on Wikimedia Commons. So what happened during the 10 years that has passed since this event, where, where were we then and where are we now? Uh, I think uh, definitely this was a first step to change mindsets in the museum sector. Museums started to realize the potential of reaching out with their collections and also reporting back amazing statistics about the actual outreach. Uh, of course, on Wikipedia, uh, museums could reach a much larger audience with their collections than through their uh, collections websites, how now millions were viewing collections that previously had been hard to find and expensive to use also. And for various reasons, the development of Open Glam is, however, quite slow, I would say, in Sweden. And one thing is that many cultural history museums have collections that don't quite, that they don't quite know how they can license under Creative Commons. And this is due to a very ambiguous uh, copyright law in the Nordic country stating that works of art are protected 70 years after the photographer has passed away and other types of photos, so-called images, are out of copyright only 50 years after the photo has been taken. So what is an image and what is a work of art in when you talk about photography? Uh, one definition states that an image can be taken by two photographers separately and they end up with a similar result. But that is all we have to lean on. So it's quite difficult for um, staff to actually make the difference and to decide if this photo is um, free to use or not. Um, an internal report from 2011 at the National Heritage Board discusses the intention of this division claiming that the intention of writing the law would have been to give the pure art photography a special protection. And this would mean even though it's not written clearly in the report that, that all other photographs are images and free to use. Uh, four years later in another report from the Digistam Secretariat, there are some clarifications made referring to image manipulation, intentional composition, intentional use of light and shadow, intentional use of flash and lenses, etc. And this raises discussions today around, for example, very intentional use of Instagram, where all of these criteria could suggest that new works of art are produced. Uh, and my point here to bring this up is that if we were to ask custodians of photography collections, uh, which parts of their collections are free to use, many would still hesitate, unfortunately. And then I haven't even mentioned the GDPR issues. <laughs> Uh, I would also say that even though much more collections are licensed online with Creative Commons, we would get different reasons for releasing images under which license, under which license from different museums. So I think that's actually a, a discussion that was vivid 10 years ago, but it needs to be brought up again. Yeah, and this is an example from Digitalt Museum, and that is a photo from the County Museum in Gävleborg, 
where they have decided to license this photo uh, with CC by ShareAlike. Uh, and again, having common discussions around how to license, I think is still very uh, important. Um, so where are we now? Uh, going back to what's happened during these past 10 years, uh, a lot has of course happened. And I think mainly art museums have done huge work by opening up their collections around the world. Uh, and in Sweden, we have the National Museum of Art sharing the collections with an open license. And the Royal Armoury uh, is another museum that have shared images online. But again, many museums still struggle with how to license images. Uh, and in these 10 years, museums funding for digitization has not increased. Previously, digitization has also been largely, largely dependent on employment measures, government funded projects for unemployed people. Uh, that since the second part of the 1990s have given temporary boosts of funding for digitization. But that means also that <clears throat> a lot of digitization that has been done in Sweden uh, was done perhaps 10 to 20 years ago or even more. And the quality of much that has been digit digitized is still not up to date with what we would need to satisfy users today and audiences, the te technologies that can be used today. So there are several issues and obstacles and challenges. Um, and yeah, these are some factors that impact where museums are today in terms of open glam. There is still need for training and education around copyright and licenses. And I would say also that there is a need for education around the use of open collections to see further good examples of uh, how the collections can be used and understand the benefits for the museums. There is a need for discussions around what we should digitize and how to enable broad use. And there is certainly a need for discussion of priorities. What could Open Glam do for museums that struggle to remain relevant today? Because I, I do believe it's much, it's about so much more than licensing, and I'll, I'll come to that in a moment. Um, it's of course not a question again only about digitizing copyrighted photographs, but also about sharing images of objects in collections. And as I mentioned, these are some challenges, and. At the same time, the very positive development is that the role model projects that we've been hearing about during the webinar series, and uh, they show that not only can museums release collections free for anyone to use, but also that Open Glam can be of great benefit for all museums. Um, Open Glam is not only about large art museums with very homogeneous visual content uh, collections that are digitized in high resolution. Um, which are perhaps easier to build on than a smaller and uneven collection with various quality. But this is where I do look forward to the new principles of Open Glam that will be presented in 2020. Because I think broadening the discussions around what Open Glam is can also bring the benefits uh, into the discussion for smaller institutions. So uh, again, I don't know what these principles will look like, um, but here are some thoughts from me. Um, the, last the last of the five or six principles from 2013 was opportunities to engage audiences in a novel ways, in novel ways on the web should be pursued. And I think this is really the key to adopting open glam smaller institutions, how we work with outreach and how we engage audiences. Even though there are issues with licensing, that is not, it's still not, I, I think that's not the major challenge anymore, even though it's still there. Instead, it's about answering the question, what's in it for me? In what way do open museum collections benefit me? Uh, as a museum, how do we align the efforts with the museum's missions and goals so that we can actually achieve our goals thanks to Open Glam? What's in it for the developers? What thing can they gain by using your content? And what's in it for the end users, of course, what makes their day better by meeting, accessing and using the museum's content through a third party developer? Having to answer these questions is very much in line with adopting new work practices generally in museums to continue to be relevant and discover new ways of engaging with and collaborating with audiences and partners. And this is a very good reason for making Open Glam an issue for the management to act upon. Um, so, yeah, that, that's the um, the final of the 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 six principles from 2013 uh, that I believe is really important. And 
I hope will be elaborated on in the next version of the principles in 2020. So the next steps of openness, what comes next? I believe that the next steps of openness should focus on creating value for audiences. And in doing so, museums will also create a lot of value for themselves. And I think this means learning how to start conversations online, how to engage audiences online, and how to package the content so that it's seen as useful for target groups. Uh, I do anticipate and hope for smaller local regional institutions to become actors uh, around Open Glam. To get here, smaller museums need to understand the potential use of their collections long term. How can, for example, the regional government be interested in using collections in their work? or local companies or nonprofits or the educational system? And how do we present collections in a way that is uh, useful for these target groups? I would love to see also collaborative projects across sectors here. And I think also regional governments would actually uh, be able to fund such projects. So um, perhaps that those are issues for the regional museums to, to look into in the, in the coming years. Uh, also, museums need to continue the dialogue of Open Glam and bring it into the management, as I mentioned before, as a key issue for museums to stay relevant today. And this is where it's important to show successful examples of other stories than from art museums, uh, how open collections can boost a community and make a difference in a local society. We need to keep sharing experiences of successful description of content, rich metadata that make collections searchable and usable. Uh, data quality is something I think museums, many museums notice and they know of, but they don't have a strategy um, as also because we're lacking resources. I would wish for workshops around improving metadata for collections so that they are relevant and useful for companies and others wishing to use the museum's API. Uh, another question to discuss is how can museums become a trusted content resource for developers and other users? Uh, and this is also where issues of ethics uh, needs to be discussed. But to get there, to build trust and to reach out, we need to learn how to start conversations online and to engage audiences. Uh, and again, I think this is key to the next steps of openness, along with openness in both directions, not only being to able to access collections, but to contribute to, to them, uh, as we have been discussing in the <clears throat> research project that I mentioned before, the Collecting Social Photo Project. Um, so in a way we are here, uh, have the opportunity uh, under the term Open Glam to merge a lot of things in museums, both collecting and dissemination and also museum experiences. Um, so again, I think this is why I believe Online collecting and, and open glam needs to be discussed and developed together in the museum sector. Uh, and of course, this means, as it always has, that we need to break the silos between collecting and dissemination, etc., and communication. To preparing for this webinar, I was looking around for current examples of museums taking a step forward around collections and came across this new collections interface. I'm sure, Neil, you know very well this. Example, uh, it's the M Plus Museum in Hong Kong. This builds on the principles of openness. And it's all about lowering thresholds and simplifying entry points, encouraging exploration of collections through continuous discovery. And it's also done by interlinking everything. So where, where you start at some point, you can go on endlessly discovering and exploring, which is really exciting. Uh, if something here relates to something else, there is a link to get you there. That's what they describe this interface with. Um, the entire design on the collections website is there to give the user an understanding also of the collections, um, because that's another issue that we have. We present um, users with uh, an ocean of objects that are mostly very, very different and different quality, etc. And, and it's difficult to get a grip of that if you don't work with the collections firsthand. I just wanted also to show the web museum website of M Plus and, and, and that's also again <laughs> surprising and sparking curiosity, encouraging further exploration of the content. Um, but the point of showing this M Plus collections interface is also to remind 
ourselves that it's not just the actual licensing of collections that matters in Open Glam, but defining an open collection and also, of course, presenting it. So trying to summarize um, my thoughts on Open Glam, and it's very much uh, about thoughts, and I would like to have a conversation, of course, about this. Uh, I think it's good in Sweden to go back to the basic principles about open collections. Uh, there is still a lot of work to be done, but I think we are on the right track. Understanding is uh, there that the collections need to be usable and licensed at, as a first step. Many Swedish museums use digitaltmuseum.se and um, I think most collections there are actually licensed with uh, a Creative Commons license. But to bring Open Glam to a much more solid foundation in the museum sector, it needs to be, again, a topic for the management. <clears throat> the role of open data in making cultural heritage institutions more accessible is central in the sense that it does support both civic society, nonprofits, and local companies uh, to develop and thrive. From my point of view at Western Norlands Museum, I see so many different uses of our collections and it's easy to imagine a much wider use if our collections were not only free to use but also searchable with rich metadata and available in high resolution. And again, if the collections were comprehensible, not just a notion of images and objects. So I think we have a lot of work to do here and uh, I hope uh, it could be also an issue that the regional museums could, could um, discuss in the years to come. So um, again, I think it's very uh, much about engaging audiences, not just online, but also in gallery, in the museum, uh, about understanding online audiences, about starting conversations online, and of course, raising general digital competence in museums. Uh, and now we are also looking at public facing activities. Uh, this encourages us to look at collections as central in the role of museums as arenas for public dialogue, for engagement around, for example, a sustainable future, around the topic of democracy, etc. So what I'm trying to say here is that once we acknowledge the role of collections as central in museums, engagement of audiences, which is something that has been discussed for decades in the museum sector, and perhaps, perhaps even more so in the last decade, then the question of Open Glam and how we define Open Glam becomes relevant on a whole different level. We move from focusing on licensing and technical solutions to the role of collections as a public interface, uh, not just uh, an interface online, but actually arena or tool for participation. Uh, we have a Swedish researcher, Eva Silvian, who wrote uh, in 2010, actually, about and not uh, actually talking about digital collections, but about collections in general. But I think it's very suitable here. She talked about collections as a public interface, a channel whereby a museum can communicate with its users and become an arena where they can meet in a joint quest for knowledge and multifaceted understandings. So um, this is where I would say museums are facing challenges with Open Glamour, the repurposing of collections the foundation for audience engagement, collaboration and participation. And a few specific areas are building trust. How do we create arenas that are trustworthy spaces for large topics such as sustainability, climate change and democracy, and also for sensitive and difficult topics? How do we pursue online dialogue around these topics? Um, engaging audiences using inclusive methods. How do we succeed in engaging successfully in dialogue with and participation, and keeping up with rapid changes, adopting new methods for engaging audiences, but also disseminating and collecting online requires constant monitoring and adoption of new work methods. And how can museums keep up with that? Um, and rapid changes require agile work methods. How can museums learn and adopt new work methods? Uh, and as I mentioned before, cross collaboration, I think is really a prerequisite as we bring together um, not only um, a very small fraction of dealing with collections and licensing, but bringing collections uh, as open and usable as arenas for conversation. Um, that means that we need to work um, cross departments uh, across departments in 
in museums. And that requires also, uh, again, adopting a new mindset. We have adopted a new, new mindset once we learned that we needed to license our content and collections, but now we need to take the next steps. And I think that uh, this is something I would really like to hear your thoughts on also both Neil and Lar Larissa. Um, that was about it from me. Thank you.